So I'm not sure if I'm going to include this segment in the Dutastride is better than Finastride video or if I'll upload it separately, but nevertheless, here it is. This is a side note on the possibility of testosterone contributing to androgenetic alopecia. To many people that claim that Dutastride made their hair worse, this is for you. Because if you take Dutastride, you run the possibility of going through an accelerated shed as a significant amount of scalp DHT is suddenly reduced which causes the hair follicles to kind of synchronize a bit more than finasteride hair follicles would normally. Again, depending on the dosage, your and also your genetics as well, you're decreasing scalp DHT between 50% to 80%. Who knows, there could be people going above that 80% range. And if you're taking that dose between 0.5 milligram to 2.5 milligram. Okay, so this is for those people. For some people, this shedding can last for some months, and for others, it can cause different parts of the scalp to shed at different times. So it is definitely a jarring experience, but it doesn't mean the drug stopped working, as many folks online say. People that say Dutastride made my hair worse, it's not working, whatever. Now, people will also talk about the increase in scalp testosterone levels. But this increase in scalp testosterone isn't why you're balding. The idea that testosterone is also the enemy leads to people doing extreme things such as experimental topical antiandrogens and even taking oral antiandrogens, believe it or not, which if you're a male to female trans identifying person, then I guess there's no issue there. You know, you know the consequences of such an endeavor. So you do what you want to do. And if that makes you feel better, then certainly go for it. But if you aren't somebody that identifies with that kind of, I guess you can say gender identity, then, well, I guess it seems like a bad idea to do that to yourself. Taking an oral anti-androgen as a cis male and then, I don't know, again, people do what they do because they want to. But if you're not really informed and you really do think that testosterone is the enemy, then don't do something stupid and look into the research a bit more. But I'm going to help people here who presume that it's their scalp testosterone that is fucking up their hair. So let's go through some points, right? We're going to use some points of logic and also research as well. This first part is going to involve a little bit of, I guess, mathematical reasoning. DHT is about two to five times more potent than testosterone. Some studies even show that it could be 10 times more potent. So decreasing DHT for testosterone doesn't increase the androgenic effects that occur on the scalp. It would actually be the opposite due to DHT's potency. If we consider the binding affinity of testosterone to the androgen receptor as binding testosterone, and if you can look at the screen, we're going to be using some mathematical variables. So we have this mathematical variable, binding testosterone. And if we consider the binding affinity of dihydrotestosterone to the androgen receptor as binding DHT. It's established that binding DHT is twice that of binding testosterone. Furthermore, if we present the disassociation rate of testosterone as disassociation testosterone and that of dihydrotestosterone as disassociation DHT, we can state that the disassociation DHT is one-fifth of disassociation testosterone, given that DHT disassociates five times slower than testosterone. Now, again, this sounds like word salad, so please look at the screen, because if you can't, I just want to let you know I'm showing some some of my math reasoning here. And if there are any like more math endowed people in the audience, you're welcome to uh, inform me better on this part if you want to. But anyway, let's keep going. The androgenic effect of a hormone is directly related to its binding affinity and inversely related to its disassociation rate. Thus, the androgenic effect of testosterone is proportional to binding testosterone divided by disassociation testosterone. And the androgenic effect of dihydrotestosterone is proportional to binding DHT divided by disassociation DHT. Using these relationships, we can deduce that the androgenic effect of dihydrotestosterone is 10 times that of 
testosterone. This indicates that for each unit of testosterone that gets converted to dihydrotestosterone, its androgenic effect is magnified about tenfold. If we inhibit this conversion process, we retain the androgenic effect of testosterone but miss out on the tenfold increase from dihydrotestosterone. By halting the conversion, we retain the androgenic effect of testosterone but lose 10 times that effect from dihydrotestosterone, resulting in a net loss of 9 times the androgenic effect of testosterone. This implies a reduction of the overall androgenic effect. Hence, inhibiting the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone always leads to a decline in overall androgenicity, regardless of how much of the conversion is inhibited. So we have some sentential logic, right? Premise 1, binding affinity and disassociation rate. Given DHT has double the binding affinity to the androgen receptor compared to testosterone, DHT has a disassociation rate five times slower than testosterone. Premise two, the androgenic effect of a hormone is determined by its binding affinity and its disassociation rate. So using the relationships from premise one, this implies that DHT has a 10 times more androgenic effect of testosterone in tissues where it's active. And finally, for premise three, inhibiting the conversion of testosterone to DHT increases the amount of testosterone, but decreases the amount of DHT. So for every unit of testosterone not converted, to DHT, you're going to witness a decline in the androgenic activity in the scalp. Because again, DHT is just more effective and more potent. So just on this first point alone, even if there is an increase in scalp testosterone due to the inhibition of its conversion to DHT, the overall androgenic effect in the scalp decreases. This is because the androgenic effect of the DHT that would have been produced is 10 times more potent, or, you know, it just is about X times more potent, if we're using the higher bound, 10 times more potent than the increase in the androgenic effect from the additional T. Hence, inhibiting the conversion of testosterone to DHT will result in a decrease in the overall androgenicity in the scalp irrespective of the increase of scalp testosterone. Now, the second point. Here, DHT and testosterone transcribe different genetic messages when they combine with the androgen receptor. I'm going to be reading from this particular study titled, quote, Modulation of Androgen Receptor Activation Function 2 by Testosterone and Dihydrotestosterone, unquote, by Askew et al. This study looks at how two male hormones, testosterone and DHT, affect the androgen receptor. This receptor plays a big role in things like muscle growth, bone health, and male reproductive development. It should also be noted that it plays a role in prostate health, as well as, you guessed it, male pattern baldness or androgenetic alopecia. While both testosterone and DHT can activate the androgen receptor, DHT does it more effectively. Imagine testosterone and DHT were keys, and the androgen receptor was a lock. Both keys can unlock the androgen receptor, however, DHT is a better fit and it turns the lock more smoothly. The authors state how DHT is required for male sexual development, whereas testosterone is the major androgen in muscle growth and muscle composition in puberty. The doctors also reference Imperato McGinley, which we will look at later, about how even with normal levels of testosterone without turning into DHT, a male fetus will not completely develop male genitalia. Now I have one more part after this, a third reasoning why testosterone isn't the enemy when it comes to scalp DHT, but just to touch on this before we get on to that third part, in that next point, I'll talk about the pseudohermaphrodites that were essentially men who were born with low levels of DHT due to having low 5-alpha reductase type 2 enzymes. This was a genetic defect that they had. Looking at Imperato McGinley et al. 1974 research on pseudohermaphrodites, these men often presented as infant girls upon their birth, having ambiguous or nearly feminine looking genitalia. However, during puberty, these men would develop full and normally sized penises, suggesting that testosterone can also be inversely used in maintaining and developing sexual characteristics. So in this regard, we have some sort of a close fit, but not a nearly perfect role of DHT, that being testosterone that steps in. But that isn't the same for androgenetic alopecia. So 
I think I'm digressing, but back to the ASCII et al. paper. The researchers found that around a tenfold higher concentration of testosterone is required to achieve the androgen receptor mediated transcriptional effects of DHT. So this means for every one molecule of DHT, you need about 10 times the same amount of testosterone to achieve the same genetic effects that would induce something like androgenetic alopecia. But that isn't possible with just testosterone alone, because it's not like you can jam 10 testosterones into a single receptor. So essentially, it's saying like, the only way you can get that sort of potency is if testosterone becomes DHT. So testosterone would have to become something entirely different. It can't be itself in order to achieve these greater transcriptional effects when it comes to DNA. You should understand that when testosterone comes in contact with the androgen receptor, or when DHT does so as well, it forms a testosterone androgen receptor complex, or a DHT androgen receptor complex. These complexes move into the cell nucleus where it interacts with DNA. You can imagine that this complex, due to its structure of DHT or testosterone, acts like a ring as it slides along your DNA. Here, certain genes are interacted with and some are not. Some are turned on and some are not at all. It depends on your genes, of course. So allow me to reiterate a bit more clearly. Both testosterone and DHT can activate the androgen receptor, but DHT does it more effectively. Again, imagine if testosterone and DHT were keys and that the androgen receptor was a lock. Both keys can unlock it, but it is DHT that is a better fit and it can turn the lock more smoothly. Back to the genetic basis, it is DHT that can transcribe more messages or different messages than testosterone can. That's why it's so potent. So in this case, like we will observe in the Imperacto McKinley reasoning in the next point, it appears as if DHT is activating the genes that are involved with androgenetic alopecia and testosterone cannot. The researchers for this particular ASCU et al. study further substantiate their claims by looking at the structure of these complexes. The primary difference in chemical structure between DHT and testosterone is that testosterone has a double bond between the fourth and fifth carbon atoms in its A ring, while DHT does not have this double bond, making its A ring saturated. It's worth looking at how the researchers were able to determine this, so I'm going to provide a gleam into their methodology. The researchers conducted a series of experiments referred to as biochemical data to understand how two hormones, testosterone and DHT, interact with the androgen receptor. Their findings revealed that testosterone does not activate the androgen receptor as potently as DHT. One of the primary reasons for this difference is testosterone's weaker interaction with specific sections of the androgen receptor, known as the FXXLF and the LXXLL motifs, particularly in a spot labeled as AF2. So again, like I mentioned before, testosterone and DHT are fitting differently when it comes to the androgen receptor, and their respective receptor complexes, the DHT androgen receptor complex versus the testosterone androgen receptor complex, potentially interact with DNA differently. Now moving on to our third point when it comes to testosterone not being the enemy of your hair follicles. It's actually DHT. So in this third point, we're going to be looking at men who are genetically deficient in the type 2 5 alpha reductase enzyme that never went bald despite having normal to high normal levels of testosterone as seen in the research of Imperato McGinley et al. 1974 in the paper titled, quote, Steroid 5 alpha reductase deficiency in men, an inherited form of male pseudohermaphroditism, unquote. Imperato McGinley et al., 1974, make note of these men and how, quote, they develop a typical male phenotype with a substantial increase in muscle mass, unquote, along with also, quote, no temporal recession, unquote. So they didn't have any recession at their hairline. They, they had full heads of hair, essentially. The extended quote also mentions how many of these men, when they were born, presented as female infants with ambiguous genitalia. 
but upon puberty, these men developed full and normal-sized penises. So this harkens back to the second point I made previously when talking about the askew et al. modulation of androgen receptors and how testosterone and DHT interact with the androgen receptor. So let us reiterate on this particular Imperacto McGinley study. And by the way, it took place in the Dominican Republic. So these Dominican pseudohermaphrodites were born with a type 2 5-alpha reductase deficiency, which caused them to have significantly lower DHT levels. They still had some DHT levels because they still had the type 1 5-alpha reductase enzyme. However, them not having much type 2 5-alpha reductase made their baseline DHT substantially lower, and thus they never went bald. And this is the reasoning, right? This is the reasoning why we use finasteride because it is a type 2 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, and we also use dutasteride as well because it is a stronger type 2 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. It seems as if when you reduce type 2 5-alpha reductase, you're going to reduce the presence of DHT in the scalp. So just these three points alone, from the first point with the mathematical reasoning when it came to the androgenicity of decreasing the scalp's androgenicity by preventing testosterone turning into DHT. Also the second point where we talk about how testosterone and DHT actually transcribe different genetic messages. And finally, to the third point, looking at Imperacto McKinley's study on the pseudohermaphrodites who were born with a 5-alpha reductase type 2 deficiency, which caused them to be deficient in DHT. And in these men, when they went through puberty and past puberty, they didn't bald on their scalps. They had no signs of temporal recession. They had full heads of hair. Again, these three points alone are enough to show us that testosterone isn't the enemy when it comes to male pattern baldness. So anyone that keeps talking about this, they need to stop. Testosterone isn't causing or I'll be charitable. It isn't significantly progressing your androgenetic alopecia. It's DHT. And if you're on a nuclear stack, maybe you just are super sensitive to DHT and perhaps a topical anti-androgen is your only go-to bet. So yeah, that's the end of this part. So I guess that's it for this video.